Good afternoon and good morning to those who are from West Coast, Alaska and Hawaii. My name is uh, Krishan Aroda. I'm the branch chief of the Networks and Development Program branch in the DRCB, which is Division for Research Capacity Building at NIGMS. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the pre-application webinar for this funding opportunity, NOT-GM-22-001 for in-brief supplements to develop research collaborations. This funding opportunity for administrative supplements to INBRI award is a continuation of our recent efforts to develop collaborations between investigators at the INBRI partner institution that include primarily undergraduate institution, community colleges, and tribal colleges and universities. With investigators that are supported by collaborating programs that are listed on this uh, NOZI, which is Notice of Special Interest for this funding opportunity. The goal of this funding opportunity is to encourage research collaborations by investigators supported by different idea funding initiatives while providing students a broad continuum of research opportunities. Next slide, please. You will hear more on this uh, nosy from Dr. Uh, Yang Zhao about the intent of this opportunity, application content, and what are the expectations and reporting requirements for the administrative supplement awardees. We made this opportunity available to you all three years back in 2018 and have done that since then in 2018, 19, and 2020. And now we have reissued this funding uh, announcement again. And during this past three years, we noticed that some of the inbreeds have availed themselves of this opportunity every year and submitted the applications. Whereas some inbreeds have availed two times and some once. And there are some inbreeds who have not availed themselves of this opportunity uh, at all and have not submitted an application in response to this opportunity. So this round, we would like to receive application from all the 24 inbreeds. And to encourage participation of all inbreeds, uh, after Young's presentation, there will be a panel session where three inbreed PIs will share the tips and best practices in developing these collaborative applications. These PIs are Dr. Carolyn Bohach, uh, who is the Idaho inbreed PI, Dr. Bongsap Chow, who is a PI for the Rhode Island Inbri, and Dr. Larry Cornett, who is a PI for Arkansas Inbri. So they'll be sharing their uh, tips uh, to how to develop this collaborative application for this opportunity. After Young's, uh, after this presentation, uh, Dr. Mingle, who is the director for the DRCB, uh, will moderate the Q&A session. And for this session, Christy Leak, who is grants management team leader, and young, and I will also join. So you can post your uh, questions in the chat window. Some of the questions that you may have about the webinar uh, are that you know that uh, uh, webinar slides and recording. Yes, the webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the NHGMS DRCB Inbri webpage. And also the uh, webinar slide will be also available and they will be also posted on the same Inbri webpage. Finally, I would like to thank our IT team for technical assistance and hope that things will go smoothly. Uh, and also please note that the application uh, deadline for this administrative supplement is January 31st, 2022. With that, I'll stop and uh, ask Young to make her presentation. Young, please take it away. All right, thanks, Christian. And hello, everyone. Thanks again for taking the time joining us today. And disclaimer, the purpose of the webinar is to provide a place for the research community and IDA states to learn more about the Embry Supplement Program and learn from other PIs experiences and ask questions if you have. If you are interested in the program, you still need to follow the instructions in the NOSI and any related notices included in the NOSI, as we may not cover everything today. Next slide. 
In the next 15 minutes, I will give you an overview of the program, including the goal of the program, some key features, eligibility criteria, application requirements, and the reporting expectations. As Krishan mentioned, the goal of the program is to encourage collaborations among investigators in IDA states while providing students more research opportunities. And there are two important components here. One is the Embry partner institutions and the other one is the collaborating programs. One objective is to provide investigators and students at the Embry partner institutions greater access to research activities supported by the IDA program at the research intensive institutions. And another objective is to encourage investigators supported by the collaborating programs to be involved in mentoring undergraduate students and building a deeper bench of research workforce. And here I listed eligible collaborating programs, including COBRE, CTR, co-funding programs, um, and IDA states pediatric clinical trial network, and CTSA clinical and translational science award, in the IDA states. And also this year we added NARCH program located in the IDA states. Next slide, please. It has been three years since the program was implemented in fiscal year 2019. And in the past three years, we have an average of 15 applications each year. And the funding rate was quite high, you can see that. 10 embrace had submitted applications all three times and five embrace submitted twice. Only three embrace didn't submit in the past three years. In terms of collaborating program, majority of them were Cobras and followed by CTRs. In 2019 awards, there were some collaborations within the same institution, but in 2020, 100% were cross institution collaborations. Next slide, please. Here are some preliminary outcome analysis results that I would like to share with you today, including the undergraduate student participation, publication, and their future grants resulting from their collaboration. On average, three undergraduate students got involved per award. And in all, we have 87 student research assistants supported based on the first two cohorts of awards. And from the PubMed data, and there is roughly one publication on average generated from the award. However, if we consider the manuscripts in preparation as reported in the RPPR, it is about two papers per award. The supplement is to provide one year support. And after that, they are expected to seek out other independent support from NIH or other sources. Slightly less than one application per award was submitted for the fiscal year 2019 and 2020 awards. Of course, we understand that it may take some time to develop a grant proposal together, and you may take additional time to submit and receive awards. As far as we know, um, Hawaii Embry Award received their NSF research grants in the area of data science, and Arkansas Embry received their R15 awards. Again, these data are preliminary and we cannot exclude the possible effect of the pandemic and the way PI reported in the RPPR. Um, while we were doing the analysis, we realized that there were some reporting issues for the Embry supplement. Uh, next slide, please, we can go to the next slide. So, um, because we, we, we figured there's some issues in the reporting and in the new NOSI, uh, a new section for reporting was added to detail the requirements of the reporting. Uh, you can see the last um, item of the table. Um, most of the Embry supplement awards, if not all, were issued in the middle of a funding period. And therefore, they will cross two funding periods. This is what we want to emphasize that please record the progress of your Embry supplement in the second funding period too. And some of, some of the PIs already done that. Thank you. If you don't do that in your next RPPR, the second year reporting will be requested. And there are also some other changes in the NOSI for the eligible collaborating programs we added in ARCH. 
is, uh, if you don't know, is Native American Research Center for Health. Um, so if there's any investigator in the NARS program that you think might be a good collaborator with your inquiry partner institution investigators, this is the opportunity for you. Another good news is that we removed the limitation of the co-funding grants. Now all years of the co-funded R01 or R15 are eligible, not only the first two years as stated in the last NOSI. Also uh, note that the new receipt date is January 31st, not the end of April. And yeah, there's only a bit over a month till the next receipt date, so not that much time left for you. With this change, we hope the awards can be made earlier around April or May. And the new NOSI will be open for three years, still one year support, supplement support, but with the budget increase to 120K direct cost. Previously, no more than 40% of the request can go to the collaborators, but it has changed to no more than 50% of the request can go to the collaborators. However, don't worry about the every partner institution. With the increase of the award budget in the new NOSI, funds to the every partner institution will not be reduced. Next slide, please. For this opportunity, the applicants should be the Embry PI. We have seen applications submitted by an investigator from the Embry Partner Institution or an investigator from their collaborating program. That is not right. Embry PI should be the PI of the supplement. When the application is submitted, your Embry should be active within the originally reviewed and approved project period. That is to say, if your Embry is on no cost extension, you are not eligible to apply. And the investigators at the Embry Partner Institution and the collaborating programs are the project leads. Similarly, the collaborating programs must be active at the time of collaboration submission and not on no cost extension. The proposed collaborative project should be a new research project, not an existing collaboration. A focused project is encouraged rather than multiple different projects. And in-state collaboration is encouraged because it will be easier for you to share resources and meet each other or visit each other's labs. Um, however, it is allowed for cross-state collaboration. And of course, the proposed project should not constitute a change in scope. Next slide. Okay, so I will briefly go through the application and submission information um, because all the information is already in the NOSI. Only one supplement request per Embry will be accepted each year. In the research strategy section, you should describe the significance of the project and the nature of the collaboration and also include a description of how students from every partner institution will be included in the collaborative research project proposed. In the approach section, each investigator from the every partner institution and their collaborating program should provide a description about their respective plans. Next slide, please. About the budget justification, Embry PI should provide a statement regarding the expenditure of currently available and obligated grant funds for the Embry. And also note that a subcontract to a non-IDA state's institution is not allowed. Also, both Embry PI and collaborating program PI should provide letters of support detailing mentoring plans and resources that will be available to support the collaborations. Next slide, please. So we already mentioned that the NOSI has added a new section for reporting, and here's more information about the requirements. In the RPPR, you should report scientific accomplishment, publications, collaborative grant application, submitted or received, and students' involvement and their scholarly activities enabled by this supplement. You should report on the first year when the award is received and also the following year when collaborative research activities continue into the next funding period. If the second year only has two months support, we would like to know more about 
their collaboration after the completion of the supplement awards. For example, are they still collaborating after the award? Are they submitting or receiving any further grants to continue their collaboration? So that kind of questions we are interested to know. And this will help us to evaluate the impact of the program in the long run. If necessary, we will contact the PI after the completion of the grant period for update on subsequent outcomes. Next slide. All right, so that is all I have for today. Please do read the notes carefully when you start to prepare your application. And we added a new FAQ page this year. I'm sure most of your questions can be answered there. If you have any questions not listed, feel free to contact me and my email is listed in the notes. Next slide. All right, happy holidays. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat box and we will do um, the questions together in the Q&A session. And now we will move to the next part of the webinar to hear some tips for the supplement application from Ingray PIs. The first presenter is from Idaho Ingray, Dr. Bohack. Dr. Bohack, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. I'm um, very excited to be here today. Um, and I think maybe my slides will be coming up here. I am the uh, PI of the Idaho Inbury. And if you could go to the next slide, probably everyone here knows that Idaho is one of these very large mountainous Western states. And on this first slide, the map of Idaho shows that there are the locations of uh, the 11 institutions that are in our INBRI network. The other thing that you can see on this map are the freeways in Idaho. Those are those white lines. And um, we have three, free rate, three freeways or expressways in Idaho. I hope what you can notice is there is no freeway going north south. So there is only one road that connects the northern panhandle of Idaho to the southern part of the state and it's a two lane highway. The other thing I want everyone to notice is that there are five institutions, Idaho partner institutions that are clustered around Boise, which is in the southwestern part of the state. So there's five institutions there. We call that the Treasure Valley. And if you look up into the panhandle, you'll see where the University of Idaho is. That's where I am. That's the awardee institution. And just south of the University of Idaho, there is one of our primarily undergraduate institutions, Lewis Clark State College. So I'm going to talk about these locations later in the presentation. And if I could have the next slide. Our charge today uh, was to talk about how we've been able to make connections across programs, how we encourage our investigators to collaborate and continue collaborating, and if we have any lessons learned. So next slide, I'm going to actually start with the bottom line. And uh, the bottom line from Idaho is that faculty in different programs need to know each other. And then the INRI administration needs to match and mentor those with compatible research interests that meet the FOA. So in Idaho, our expert in this area is the program coordinator, Dr. Sam Minnick. Many of you probably know him, but he is a great scientist. He's interested in all kinds of biomedical research, everything. And he knows all of the idea research and researchers in Idaho. I wanted to rephrase our bottom line, uh, maybe in a more memorable way. And that's at the bottom of this slide in green. Um, collaboration is not a blind date. It's an arranged marriage set up by the INBRI parents. And so if I could have the next slide. I hope that's a memorable way to put it. I'm going to share three tips with you from Idaho INBRI, and you can go to the next slide. Our first tip is to use the INBRI to develop cobras. When I tell my colleagues about this idea, 
they're very surprised. They say, they say, say what? Are you kidding? What are you talking about? And if you could go to the next slide, um, this we started quite a long time ago, actually, in 2009, when the Idaho INRI was up for competitive renewal, it's INRI 3, part of our research core in that renewal was to include something we called a mini COBRE model. And in that model, we identified a research leader on a campus, and then we chose three to five investigators around that research leader in their area of expertise. And in that 2009 INBRI uh, um, proposal, we had identified two of these research leaders, Julie Oxford with expertise in matrix biology at Boise State University, and Denny Stevens with expertise in infectious disease at the Boise VA Research Foundation. Our INBRI funding during that five-year period um, uh, helped prepare these two research leaders to apply for COBRE, which they did uh, straight away in uh, sequentially in 2013 and 2014, they applied for and were awarded COBRAs. The result of this practice is that these two COBRAs are solidly in the Idaho INRI network. Next slide. My second tip is to host INBRI COBRE and research intensive, primarily undergraduate institution networking activities. And when I tell my colleagues across the nation that Idaho is doing the, that, they all say, oh my gosh, that's a lot of work. So how does Idaho do it? Next slide, please. Um, this has actually been a very long 10 year investment and our activities have centered in two places. The first is in that Treasure Valley uh, where we host uh, research and professional development meetings. We include all five of the Inbury institutions. They're within a 35 mile radius of each other. And now we have two Cobras in that uh, area of Idaho and we invite everyone, faculty, students and staff from the INBRI, from the Oxford COBRE, and from the Stevens COBRE. We do a similar networking activity uh, in the Panhandle at the University of Idaho with that primarily undergraduate institution, Lewis Clark State College. We're just 40 miles apart from each other. And the activity we do are monthly dinners. This is time to socialize and break bread in a non-threatening setting. So when we do things up in the panhandle at the University of Idaho, I host these in my house. I'm, I've actually been told by the younger generation that nobody is doing this anymore. Nobody invites people over to their house, but, but, but I do. Um, when we're in the Treasure Valley, we're using private banquet rooms uh, at restaurants or private rooms in university or on the college campus. The format for these activities have been very different. Talks, scientific talks, best practices, panels. That format does not matter. What matters is this time to socialize in a non-threatening setting so that the investigators from these different institutions get to know each other and talk freely about their work, their interests, their students. The result from this is that the faculty get to know each other. Next slide, please. The third tip I want to share is that uh, we use the Embry supplement application as a mentoring tool. And when I talk to my colleagues about this idea, they also say, oh my gosh, that's so much work. And I agree, it is. So next slide, how do we do this? Um, again, this is is Dr. Minnick, the Idaho INRI program coordinator, Dr. Minnick, Sam Minnick, knows all the research investigators and he's like a coach. He knows everyone's strengths and weaknesses. So when a supplement opportunity uh, comes about, um, the applicants are identified, 
they write a proposal and we make it due very early, way earlier than it's due to the NIH. And then Dr. Minnick and I do interactive editing of their writing. This is a very intensive work with the investigators that are applying for, uh, for the funding. And the result is that the investigators learn how to critically improve their grant writing skills. And we find that our INBRI network is really strengthened. We get to know the faculty and of course, then they tell the other faculty the kind of work that they did with me and Sam. And in the next slide, I brought a couple of the quotes from the, in the, um, the project leaders that, um, that we have uh, helped write uh, the proposal. So this first one, I continue to be stunned by what you two can do. I have read this thing approximately 20 times and I get bogged down in detail. You guys just blast through and come up with simple sentences that summarize complex things. Just amazing, thank you. Next quote. I know I'm a pretty good writer, but you really polished that up amazingly. I mean, this is so common. These um, junior investigators, they really believe that they are fabulous writers and they often don't see that their writing could be improved until you actually go very slowly with them sentence by sentence. The third quote, wow, you two are truly masters at grant writing. I am not kidding. First, I appreciate your talent of seamlessly weaving the lung and bone components of the grant. Second, I like how you write to address the supplement call and deliberately talk about the Idaho INBRI program. You make it easy on the reader. Again, I mean, we all know these are grant writing skills. You write to address the supplement call. And um, it's always a good lesson learned. And I, I put these up, you know, not to aggrandize ourselves, but to just show you that the investigators really get something out of the interaction. Next slide. So um, I do want the message to be that these supplements are a, at least for Idaho, <laughs> a huge amount of work. We are very, very appreciative of uh, the supplement funding and Ming Lei, I'm gonna call you out for making this money available to us. Every single dollar has been, uh, had, had a positive impact on the, on the investigators that, that got these funds. But we also did an estimation of <laughs> what it takes to get them. And at least in our approach, uh, it takes us more than 200 man hours to apply for each supplement. Of course, this is because Dr. Minnick and I are closely helping these applicants write and rewrite the proposal. We also have the INBRI administrative staff and the Office of Sponsored Program staffs, not only at the University of Idaho, but at the partner institutions, which are helping with lots of the paperwork. And when I talk to my colleagues across the nation, they really are telling me, oh, those supplements, they are just way too much work for too little money. And so um, I'm gonna have a really cheeky comment here. Um, I hope I don't get in too much trouble at the NIH, but I would really like to see an increase in the total number of dollars coming to the INRI program and then exclusively sequester some of that money specifically for INRI and other IDEA program collaborative research if that is a, a goal of, of the IDEA program. And uh, next slide, um, I would again like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Sam Minnick. He's the driving force of the research accomplishments in the Idaho INBRI. And I want to again mention Dr. Julie Oxford and Dr. Denny Stevens. These two COBRE PIs have an amazingly generous spirit to share their uh, activities with Idaho INBRI. And, and that's how all our investigators know each other. And with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Carly. And nice presentation. Thanks for sharing your tips and providing your suggestions. And I think I agree, it is a lot of work. Um, now we'll um, 
We have three minutes for questions. And if you have any question, please raise your hand using the Zoom function. I didn't see any. Yeah. Oh, there's one, John. Yeah, I see one hand in John. Yeah. John, please unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Yeah, um, I put this in the chat. I was just curious. Um, uh, uh, I'm still not totally clear on the scope of the collaborations. Are these collaborations that have to be across multiple institutions or can they be within a single institution? So this question probably not to Carolyn, right? <laughs> no, right. This is for the right. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. So uh, Ming, you want to um, we answer the question now, or we'll limit the question to Carolyn? Let I think we should discuss all the questions at the end, mm -hmm. probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So maybe um, we'll move forward and then we'll um if you have any questions during the presentation um just put it in the chat box so we'll do the q a session together at the end okay so we'll move on to the next presenter dr cho from rhode island Embry. dr cho please yes thank you thank you Yan. <clears throat> i appreciate this opportunity to to talk about our experience and the uh, tips from Rhode Island Inbrae. So let me tell you a little bit about Rhode Island IDEA programs. Uh, thanks to the uh, IDEA dashboard, which is wonderful, we're able to get all these numbers. So right now, Rhode Island has 18 awards. Um, obviously one Inbrae, one CTR, 13 COBRA, including no cost extension one, and then uh, three R01 co-fundings, and then um, Idea State Pediatric, uh, the, the, uh, I forget C, the, the clinical trial network. And so we're bringing a total of um, over 30 million for FY21. And so I guess this is an advantage for us because uh, there are so many idea entities. So we are able to work together and send out information and then be able to, to alert idea community for this possibility. But we actually do a, a lot more. For example, we actually idea PIs in Rhode Island meet quarterly, we used to meet monthly actually, but now quarterly and all idea PIs and staff uh, meet in person in, at Brown University, but not anymore because of COVID. Um, so we do a program introduction and then discuss idea businesses. And then we exchange information and grants information, pilot project, because there are a lot of a COBRA in Rhode Island. And so we, each COBRA is doing you know, pilot programs. And so we try to uh, adjust timing and that kind of stuff. And so we discuss that. And then core facility items. And then we share seminar uh, announcement as well. Um, in 2020, we actually, because of COVID, we thought it was a good idea to have a virtual seminar series featuring IDEA PIs and uh, Rhode, Island, Rhode Island Inbre um, hosted this. And then, so we had 10 IDEA PIs and two training grants, including Mark U. Starr and graduate 
uh, training program at Brown University. So the purpose of this seminar, as you can see on the uh, flyer example here, is to introduce core, the uh, COBRA and INBRA and CTR directors, because these PIs work hard, get their programs run, running, but they're not getting lots of attention. And so we thought it was a good idea to, to bring the PIs and talk about their um, ideal program, program, but also what they do in their personal research. And they're great scientists as well. So, and so we wanna recognize their contributions to the, uh, the state of Rhode Island bio medical research capacity. And so next slide. The reason I wanna show you all this, or to tell you about this is because PIs in, Rhode, in, in state of Rhode Island, the IDEA programs, we really have a close contact. So this past summer, we did a virtual Northeast Regional Conference, VNARI. We hosted it and uh, we featured um, three keynote speakers and eight science sessions, and then six lightning talk sessions for trainees. And um, the topic for this is a new ideas and new discoveries. I think it's a cute uh, promo. And um, about 300, uh, 650, uh, people have attended, uh, it was a successful event. And the reason I wanna, I, I wanna talk to you is because Rhode Island IDEA program supported the bulk of this event. So we had 14 sponsors. Of those 11 were Rhode Island IDEA PIs and they chipped in, you know, 2000 to $4,000 on this, um, the regional conference. And then we are planning to do this um, annual meeting again um, next year, in June 10th. And the topic is health disparities in clinical and translational research. So the bottom line is the Rhode Island IDEA PIs have a very, very close um, relationship. And so it's a bit easier for us to, to do this supplemental um, process. Next slide, please. So I agree with Caroline that this is a great program. I've been involved with a Rhode Island in, in Brave for from the beginning. And I always wondered about this collaborative grant. And uh, I guess thanks to Ming Lei, this is, this is possible and then continuously doing so. So I think it's a great program. I don't have a, you know, great, great stories to, to, to tell you how we do this, but essentially just like what Ida was doing, essentially we alert all IDEA programs about this opportunity and solicit participation. We send the details of um, you know, RFA and uh, FAQ, along with our current and recent INBRI awardees. And so this year, it was about uh, 25 grants. So we include name and affiliation of a partner institution and the abstract of, of their you know, projects and, uh, and sent to our partner institutions. We have a Salve Regina, Providence College and Rhode Island College, Roger Williams and Bryan University. We recently had added uh, Johnson and Wales um, to the partner institution. So we send this information to them because we know each other and, and we're trying to help each other. And so we get some nominations and I have to tell you, but it's not like we're getting tons of nomination, we get few. 
but in the end, you know, one that matters, right? And so we nominated um, the, uh, the, uh, the nominees and then discussed the project together and then get to know what they want to do and then help out how they can work together. And then in the end, based on the, uh, the following um, criteria, we actually choose one for proposal development and then help and guide along and package it. And that takes a long time, actually, a lot of communications. But I think it's worthwhile to help out, you know, these investigators. And, you know, these are not really rookie investigators. They've done their proposals to Rhode Island Inbrace, so they already know how to package it and all that. But collaboration is a different um, thing, so we really have to help them out to make it happen. So the criteria is um, are the following. What we look at is uh, their research project complementarity. So one thing that, you know, I can tell you a little bit about our the supplemental project, but they really have to, um, to contribute each other. And so that's what we're looking at, complementarity. And one good example is one group does make molecules from natural source or synthetically, and then other group actually testing it their efficacy. I think those are great, you know, complementarity, and that's what we're looking for. And the second category is uh, doability. They can actually do this in one year and be able to actually produce something, you know, in publication or collaborative proposal development and whatnot. And so that's what we're looking for. And then we'll really want uh, their enthusiasm, right? Real collaboration. And particularly on the COBRA side, tends to be uh, established researchers and their enthusiasm to work with the PUI faculty and bring their students in their lab and be, to want to really train students. And so, that enthusiasm is, a, is, a, is an important consideration. And so with, the, with this criteria, we you know, um, select one and to, to, to package a proposal. Next slide, please. So we um, had so far, so far three supplemental awards, right? The first one in 2019, and all of them are in Bray Cobra. So Susan met with Salve Regional University for in Bray and Dr. Beth Hughes at Rhode Island Hospital. So Cobra is Center for Antimicrobial Resistance and Therapeutic Discovery. And this is a relatively new Cobra. And so the COBRA PI and Elipteris and I have a conversation how we can package this together. And so the, this one worked out really well and uh, they actually published a paper as you can see here. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's October, 2021. That's uh, only you know, one year after the actual project was completed. And I think that was a huge accomplishment. As you can see, there's drawing some views here. And, uh, and the student to the first author is from Salve Regina University. And, um, and I think this opens you know, doors for future collaboration. And Susan was telling me that they're still you know, involved in this and then her students, Salve Regina, still go to a Hughes lab and then they, their collaboration is ongoing. 
And Susan is uh, very successful in, 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 in another grant. And um, she received a, this Office of Research on Women's Health Supplemental. And so this was a collaboration between Susan and the, um, the Dr. Camberg and Dave Raleigh at, U, at URI. And so I think she's doing really well. And, um, and she was, you know, our INBRE investigator and she's looking at all these possibilities. I'm, I'm so happy that, that she's doing really well. And this is a one case where Susan is a synthetic chemist and Beth Hughes is, a, is an assay person and they were able to do this in, in such a timely manner. And, and so it worked out really well. So this is a good example of uh, complementarity. Next slide, please. So our second one was also in Bricoba, and this is Chris Reed at Bryan University for World on Inbre, and Joe Bliss at Women and Infants Hospital of Rhode Island. Um, from COBRA for per, per, perinatal, perinatal biology. And I think this COBRA is in phase three in no cost extension. So it's the same kind of situation. Chris Reed isolate and synthesize molecules and Dr. Bliss is doing assaying. And it's another example of complementarity that worked out really well. So the Dr. Reed was telling me that, um, that there, his students have presented um, some a poster in, back in April, 2021, virtual obviously, and then the, at, at Sigma Xi National Meeting back in November, and Dr. Reed is very, very active actually, and received a voucher from uh, Arkansas Inbre. And so she, he just um, is about to send some samples uh, for proteomic analysis. And so he's, he's really doing well and he's a very productive. And I think this supplemental award really helped him in a great deal. And the last one is also in Cobra and uh, Jamie, Dr. Jamie Towell Wixell at Rhode Island College for Rhode Island Inbre and Dr. Uyung So at Rhode Island Hospital representing Cobra for skeletal health and repair. And this Cobra is also phase three. So their title is a nanoparticle mediated drug discovery for inflammatory arthritis. This is an interesting one because Jamie wanted to, to get involved in this nanotechnology. And I think, and, and Dr. So was already doing this. Although their area of uh, expertise is a bit different, but because of enthusiasm in the subject matter, I think that Dr. So has capability of uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, nano uh, particle based on research. And uh, Jamie was quite interested in this. And so they were able to come up with a project and that worked out quite well. So they received, um, this supplemental money not too long ago, so obviously they don't have a lot of uh, data to show up, but uh, I was told they're setting up some protocols and testing methods for animal experiments. Next slide, please. So I want to say again that this is a great collaborative idea program and I think should, it should continue and I noticed that over the last two, three years that NIGMS staff is making a, a 
good changes and listening to issues and then and, and, and they're you know making some changes I think that's good and uh, one in, one interesting one is that they they changed the timeline a little bit I think that's very helpful so I just want to say one thing there were some wrong perceptions if you will that this is a um, and not a true one-year project, and it's a very short timeline, and that kind of a you know was very it's a it's a you know kind of things that people talk about. You know, this is a one year, but in reality, it's not. You know, the anxiety there, and uh, if you look at our case here in this table. So notice of a notice release for 2019, 2021, as you can see here, it's an early year, right? It's January, you know, February and, and March. Submission due is around, you know, May. And the notice of award, as you see here, is a, you know, August and July in that time frame. And then grand end date, in our case, is uh, the end of April. And so this puts a little you know, anxious for uh, investigators to figure out you know, whether this is a truly one year project. But we found out that uh, the extension is you know, possible into a second year. And so that the, the one year, you know, project that that issue has been taken care of. And I know that Yang and uh, Christian will talk about a little more on this. And so we're very happy to see uh, some flexibility that, that we see from uh, IDEA program. And so that's, that was uh, one, you know, sort of a wrong impression, perceptions out there and that should be clear. So I think that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bonsap. I'm sure, uh, thanks for sharing. I'm sure your misperception discussion will be great help to others too. And now we'll open the floor for a discussion. If you have any questions, raise your hand. Yeah, we'll wait for 30 seconds. If there's no question, we'll mm -hmm. move on to the next. Hi, I, I have a question. Oh, Richard, uh, yes. Hi, Sorry. this is Rick Inagihara from the University of Hawaii. So I'm curious to know what happens to those collaborative uh, projects that are not selected to go forward? Or do you continue to invest in those collaborations? Y yes, and so what we do is uh, we always ask them to look for next year's supplemental. So we keep that conversation going and, and then encourage them to, uh, to try it again. And so have you ever selected um, one from that group for the following opportunity? No, we've, we've done it, you know, yeah, three times, no. Thank you. So if you have any questions to Dr. Cho, please, we'll wait a few more seconds. Could I ask a question for Dr. Bohatch? Uh, Christian. Yes, is it? Caroline is still there, Caroline? Yes. Yeah, so now we're so, going to do the questions at the end. No, I'm here. I can answer a question. Okay. I'm worrying uh, about Larry Cornett. 
presentation. Yeah, so, so, right. I'm running out of time. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I enjoyed your presentation. Um, in, so during this COVID period, how have you actually managed to get together or have you? Has it all been virtual? Well, you know, we're in Idaho and we uh, most of the population here doesn't believe there's a pandemic. So uh, yes, we, we get together uh, in person. Uh, we, we cannot ask about vaccination. We can't talk about vaccination. People wear um, masks. Thank you. I think we should continue uh, next. Uh, okay. So now we will move on to the next presenter, um, Arkansas Embry PI, Dr. Cornett. Hey, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I, I want to start out and um, disclose that um, we've submitted three supplements and we've only gotten two of them. And I was sort of comparing my percent success rate, which is 66% with the overall success rate, which is around 95%. So I'm actually embarrassed and not even sure why I'm asked to uh, to talk about um, our experiences, but I will anyway. Um, second thing I'd like to say is I'd like to acknowledge um, my program coordinator, uh, Dr. Jerry Ware. He, he also runs our DRPP program. And, and like Dr. Minnick in um, Idaho, um, Jerry is actually on top of all the research that is going on in Arkansas through, through the um, through the Enbrae network. And so uh, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is um, due to his hard work. I'm gonna really quickly cover three main areas. First, I'm gonna make a few comments about how you nurture collaborative or team science. Then I'm gonna talk about two our two successful collaborative proposals. And then I'm gonna wrap up with a few extra tips on how um, we make uh, collaborative research work in Arkansas. So can I have the next slide, please? So here's the official definition of collaboration. Um, two or more people, entities, or organizations working together to complete a task or achieve a goal. But there's actually an alternative um, explan uh, definition of collaboration. Could I have the next slide? I really like this definition. Um, I think it's closer to reality. And the other reason I like it is because it's attributed to Dr. Jocelyn Elders, who is from the state of Arkansas. She's a former US Surgeon General under President Clinton. And she's now Professor Emeritus at my institution, University of Arkansas for Medical Science. And here's her quote. Collaboration has been defined as an unnatural act between non-consenting adults. Um, we all say we want to collaborate, but what we really mean is that we want to continue doing things as we've always done it, while others change to fit what we are doing. So this is all to say that it's not always easy to um, collaborate. And I think this is one of the challenges that, that we face when we, we as Inbrae PIs try to put together um, teams that can um, actually collaborate and, and do what we want them to do. Um, next slide. So um, there's a lot of literature out there um, on how to stu stimulate collaboration or team science. Uh, one of the better sources I found is actually free. It comes out of NCI. Um, and I have the link and the slide to that uh, field guide to collaborative and team science. There's a lot of good information in there. But the key elements that I think um, we all need to keep in mind when we're trying to um, develop a successful collaboration. So first off, it's a numbers game. We all have a finite number of investigators within our networks. And it's not always possible to put together the, the right members of the team to do what you actually want it to do. The other um, confounding factor is that sometimes personalities come into play and it's not actually maybe possible to, to put together a team uh, with the uh, component parts that you have because of 
divergent personalities. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, collaborations can be driven top down or they can actually come from the bottom. Um, trust among collaborators is, is a big deal. We have to pay attention to that. Um, ideally, in my mind, people will often self-assemble to collaboratively address a scientific problem. And then um, having said all this, it's important to have support from leadership and funding that can greatly improve the chances of success. And this is, this is why the support from um, NIGMS and the IDEA program for these collaborative um, projects is so important. So um, next slide. So this is what I have to work with um, in Arkansas. We have um, six COBRAs. We have a CTSA grant. Um, we have the ISPCTN Data Coordinating and Operations Center. And we have a clinical site for the ISPCTN that's in Arkansas Children's Hospital. And then we have um, six co-funded uh, grants that you can see there. Um, I'm gonna tell you about two or two successful collaborative proposals. And then we had a third one that was submitted this past year um, with um, an investigator from a COBRE and that one was not successful. I'm not gonna tell you about that one. Next slide. So here's the first successful one. This was um, in response to um, GM 19-025. Um, the premise of this was that um, you can, RBCs, red blood cell um, production um, requires a, a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO. Um, human EPO is primarily made in vitro in mammalian cell culture systems. It's used to treat humans. Um, but there it's, it's expensive and um, production of EPO in plants is a less expensive alternative. So we have an investigator in one of our um, network institutions, Arkansas State University, um, Dr. Zhu, who has been funded in the past to develop plant produce, a plant produce system to produce um, erythropoietin. And this is in a tobacco um, cell line in vitro. So what he could do is actually make the erythropoietin and he could test its um, functionality in in vitro systems, but he was he's unable to um, test the material in animal systems at his um, home institution. So it turned out there's a um, investigator with a, affiliated with the COBRE at Arkansas Children's Hospital who is funded to study defects in a disease called diamond black fan anemia. And he uses animal models to functionally characterize various um, proteins um, in, in um, this blood disease. So he was well able to um, offer up his model systems to functionally characterize the erythropoietin that Dr. Zhu was producing in plant cells. Um, Dr. Zhu made a very nice presentation on this work at the 2021 Southeast Regional IDEA meeting in Puerto Rico. And, and I fully expect that we'll have a publication out of uh, this work in the not too distant future. So the next slide. This one was a little different. So this was successful supplement number two for us in response to 20, um, 012. Um, and I should say the our first successful supplement and this one as well are examples of kind of top-down driven collaboration. So this was, um, this particular one was kind of my idea. The premise is that we all know there's a shortage of uh, clinician scientists nationally. And, and what I've noticed in my state, I think it's true probably across the, across the country is that many pre-med majors as undergraduates don't un think about going into medicine to treat patients. They don't really think about going into medicine to be a clinical investigator. 
So um, the idea here was to provide undergraduate students with a team-based translational research experience. So um, we brought together the director of our Clinical Translational Science Award, um, our CTSA, and it's called the Translational Research Institute, that's Laura James. And then the other half of the, the team was, the, was Dr. Andres Caros, who is an associate professor at Hendricks College, who is um, in our network. And basically Dr. Caro um, um, recruited students from Hendricks College. Um, we put them through a semester long program where they were exposed to a research project that's being sponsored through the CTSA basically to um, study new treatment strategies to minimize uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome in newborns. And, and the, the um, research involves investigators at Arkansas Children's Hospital, UMS, University of Louisville, and then Pinpoint Testing, which is a small startup in, in Arkansas that basically measures um, opioid levels in this study. So um, this was a, this, we just wrapped this one up. Um, it's, we have a lot of evaluation data on uh, the students and, and their expectations going into this program, as well as what they learned uh, following um, their semester in the program. And we fully expect to have a publication um, coming out of this in the not too distant future. So can I have the next slide, please? So my final thoughts are um, when we're thinking about um, responding to these opportunities for collaborative research that are coming out of the IDEA program is first and foremost is really consider the key elements for successful collaborations that you can find in that field guide um, from the people at the NCI. So there are a couple of extra things that I, I'd like to share with you. And these are things we're doing in Arkansas to st stimulate collaboration among um, idea supported uh, programs in the state. So we have quarterly meetings of um, the, all the PIs of the idea um, supported programs, the COBRAs and the INBRE, as well as the, um, the co-PIs from the IDEA States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network, and then the CTSA PI. So, so we're using those meetings to learn about our, our programs, what we're doing, who we're supporting. And so that goes a long ways to, to help me understand what's being done in, in, these, in the COBRAs and the CTSA and the ISPCTN. Um, the second thing, and I think we all, we all do this is that um, COBRE supported and IDEA co-funded supported faculty serve as mentors for our INBRE funded faculty. We have a requirement that all the INBRE faculty or faculty who are supported by INBRE have to have mentors. So, so this in and of itself kind of stimulates collaborations. And we've had situations where um, mentors for our um, INBRE supported faculty actually turn into collaborators on their own without any additional support from us. Um, we also, and this is something Dr. Ware started a couple years ago, is that when we review proposals for the DRPP, we actually do it in the same way that NIH runs study sections. And, and so we invite COBRE funded faculty to serve on those review panels. And we also invite PUI faculty to serve on those review panels. So that becomes another way that, that COBRE funded faculty and, and INBRE supported faculty actually um, see each other, meet each other and kind of learn about what they, what they do. So it's a, a great opportunity for um, getting those faculty together. And then finally, um, we kind of, and this again was Jerry's idea, is that we now offer collaborative research grants ourselves as a way to kind of prepare or to increase the level of collaboration in our state. So these grants 
fund um, investigators from PUIs to work with other investigators at PUIs or to work with investigators at our lead institutions. So um, we feel like this is a way to kind of better set ourselves up to be successful in, in future collaborative opportunities from NIGMS. So I will stop there. Um, happy to answer any questions and then look forward to the discussion at the end. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Larry. Thanks for sharing your experience in collaboration and great talk. And now, if you have any questions um, to Larry, please raise your hand. We'll wait for 30 seconds. Okay, I didn't see any hands. So we'll move on to the next uh, final Q&A session. So Dr. Lei, the director of DRCB will be moderating. Okay, uh, thank you all. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Uh, I think between Larry's um, unconsenting adult and uh, Caroline's arranged marriage, there are a lot of perspectives and wisdoms in between. Uh, I wish there would be um, um, other members of the community, uh, uh, idea communities uh, are here to benefit from uh, those uh, uh, wisdoms. And I think all three talks uh, offered a lot of uh, uh, good practices, great uh, strategies. Um, <clears throat> um, it's really very, should be very, very helpful to everybody. Um, <clears throat> but I apologize that uh, unfortunately, maybe it's too close to the holidays, the attendance is not great, uh, but I, I want to, um, make an offer that if you spread the word among your peers, if there's an interest, we can run this session again. Um, I just felt like, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, I think Jan did a great job in clarify a lot of the uh, programmatic uh, considerations and our three um, Embry PIs offered a great deal, great deal of um, wisdom and uh, experience to help the community. Um, so if there's an opportunity, there is a need, we can, we, we're certainly happy to do this again. Uh, but um, although we, the original plan is to, I was going to moderate the, the uh, QA and discussion session, but since we don't have a whole lot of people here, I would just say you raise your hand if you have a question or comment, and uh, uh, you can just unmute yourself and go for it. Um, so let's say there was a question from uh, uh, John. Uh, John, you want to um, ask your questions? question again? I think the examples, I think, uh, helped explain it to me a little bit better, but I, I, I was just curious whether there are examples where uh, the targeted collaborations fall within one institution. I don't think we have a, a specific restriction from a single institution. And at this point, I think the only restriction is that on the Imbri side, it should not be from, the program should not be from the research intensive uh, uh, institution.
correct, Jan? Correct. So actually in fiscal year 19, we have five uh, supplement awards from the same institution. So it is allowed. And make sure the Embry is the partner institution and the Cobra, um, like both of the program are active. And yeah, and Cobra already like a research intensive. So the goal is to let the Embry partner institution investigators to um, get more access to research um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you so much. I, I can add uh, one thing is that the three supplements that we have gotten, one of them, they already had a some sort of a collaboration going on beforehand. And so that was very easy to, uh, to work it out. But the other two, they actually look at the announcement from Rhode Island Inbrae and showed interest. And so we actually act as a mediator and then make it work. And sometimes the subject matter is a bit difficult. And uh, we, have a, we had a one case last year, there was a, a person who's doing artificial intelligence. And so we're trying to, uh, to make a match in some way, some fashion, it didn't work out last year and there was a not enough time so we decided okay we're gonna look look at it one you know one more year next year to do it in the meantime if you are interested in maybe you can look at our inbury investigators and see see what you can uh, what you can do and so it's a kind of combination of the uh, previous collaboration and the new collaboration, and new collaboration required a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more work to, to, to make it happen. Good. Um, I want to just add a little bit um, to to this point. Is you look back um, how the, the the rationale we started the program. It was really at the point. It was very clear that while the IDEA program supposed to be a close net community, but somehow over 20 years, we managed to build silos. Find so The Imbris, the Cobris, the, uh, the CTRs, um, at least in many places, don't really talk. Sometimes they are the PIs are located next to their, you know, the two buildings next to each other. They are not aware of what each other are doing. So at the same time, there was a clear uh, need to, or benefit to be ripped off from, uh, uh, talking to each other as we out, uh, young outline, the two primary objective is for the embraced faculties and students have better access to the more research intensive projects. And the other, on the other hand is to have the COBRI and CTRPIs to be involved in mentoring and also they often face and complain the great challenge of in being an idea state and idea institution, how difficult it is to have your own pipeline. So that we felt this is an opportunity to build the, a bench. So therefore, we really um, made an effort to make this opportunity as flexible as accommodating as possible. You can see the three-year evolution is we constantly tweak it to make it more easier to, to implement. And uh, practically, as Larry noted, the, the success rate is what, 95%, Larry, by your calculator? And I challenge you to go around NIH to find another program is as supportive as this. So really is, we really want to create a platform for investigators 
not only the PIs, the investigators in the program to talk to each other. When you talk, you know that there are opportunities, there are more readily available opportunity, opportunities as Don Show just mentioned, existing uh, shared interest. Then there are others, right, that you can develop. So um, that is the motive, I think, um, from the incomplete report Young Gather, I think we um, reached, fulfilled the goals by, you know, uh, 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 very well, you know, they're, they're, the people started talking, we're producing ast astonishing number of publications and the, the new grants are coming up. So I just, I think um, it is a great opportunity. Uh, Caroline mentioned that the dollar number may not be as, as satisfying as you may want, but measuring by outcome is very productive. Ming could, Ming, could I ask either you or Yang a question? And I'm sort of embarrassed to ask this, but with the current, with the current nosy, is there any, um, is there any um, restriction on the INBRE investigator? I think in the past, it had to be somebody who was supported by the INBRE. Is that still the case in the current NOSI? Great point. Yeah, uh, why don't you go ahead? Um, I don't quite understand the question. You mean the INBRE investigator like uh... Um, there's any restriction for the investigators? Yeah, I, I, I think in the past, um, the INBRE investigator in the collaborative project had to be somebody who had been supported by, by the INBRE program over a certain, going back a certain number of years. Right. And so that, that... That sort of, that sort of restricted the pool of potential investigators that we Well, have. so one criteria would be the investigator from INBRE partner institution. And the other one is the investigator need to be currently supported or was supported by the program during the current five year INBRE award. So that is two uh, criteria you need to meet, yeah. Have you guys ever discussed the possibility of maybe just relaxing that requirement a little bit and and allow us to um, use investigators at our PUIs who have not yet been supported by our through our DRPP um, or, you know what's let me, the, let me take this Larry yeah, sure. uh, we obviously we are open to considerations like this and uh, we actually implemented a very similar policy like you proposed in another uh, supplement initiative. But for this, I think we, ch for this one, we choose to keep this, but we're open to, to your suggestions because the reason for that is given the broad coverage of inbreed, the there might be a need to um, draw a line somewhere because otherwise technically everybody in your institution would be eligible so if that is the imbri pi's consider uh, a preference we can we can consider but we thought this um might be uh, 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 just considered to maintain the, let's say for lack of a better word, the, um, the Embry program, uh, not diluted by too much, but it's a great question. Yeah, uh, something to consider. And I guess I'd, 
I'd like to hear from Carolyn maybe and Bong Sook about their thoughts on, on this issue, because as I pointed out in one of my slides, it is kind of a numbers game when you're trying to stimulate collaboration. And I think I heard from you, you're a little disappointed in the number of applications you're getting. And, and maybe one of the rate limiting steps is that um, the Embrace don't have a, enough to choose from, you know, among investigators they've supported during their current. So, so let me put it this way, all right? So um, yes, I, I, for those of you who um, paid attention, actually, when we started this, my expectation is I was going to get, we're going to get 24 applications. So the first year we got 18. Um, and I think it is a great opportunity that, that it should be taken advantage of from that perspective. But, um, but in terms of pool, uh, I think this discussion is very um, useful is that even with the constraint Jan just articulated, currently supported or previously supported, right? So I was thinking, especially in the context of the POIs, uh, I think the line can be very loosely drawn. All the POI PIs, if they're involved in the summer program, um, Maybe, maybe we were wrong. Uh, they were all considered supported, right? In, in Inbreed, it's not like a Cobra, you have a research project leader who are you know, formally considered uh, uh, supported. So um, I think that the, the balance is that we want to give the Inbreed PI some measure in, in, in control the program because otherwise the next step really is given the nature of the Embry program is every PI, every faculty in your institution. Uh, I don't know if that is what you want, but from the, on the PUI side, basically is your developmental program, every PI supported by that program is eligible for this. Well, just to be clear, I mean, my allegiance is to my PUIs. I'm, I'm not interested in getting... Yeah. Right, getting so that, that would be, uh, I, I think you should, I would encourage you to interpret that policy generously, aggressively. I have a, one clarification for INBRE eligibility. It's very clear. Anybody who have been awarded during the current Inbre award, right? So who are active at the moment, and then those who have gotten, you know, awards in the last two years, two and a half years in our case, and graduated, they're all qualified. In the case of COBRA and others, they have to be, must be active at the time of application. That's what the slide says, Yan, is that true? Right. Yes, it has uh, both of like Embry and Cobra need to be active at the time of application, not on low cost extension. No, but for Embry, those who have gotten grants a couple of years ago and graduated. Yeah, that's for the investigator eligibility. Yes. So right. for Cobra, it would be the same. So Embry, uh, but Cobra investigators, if they like uh, were supported, they were also eligible in that like a five-year COBRA funding period. They were. Okay, okay. So when you say must active in that slide, it, it, it was a little bit confusing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. But that means the program, COBRA program, not the investigator. Yeah, the same criteria applies to the INBRI and COBRI also as well. Okay, okay. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. And I think the the is sort of provide you assurance that you have a collaborator who have an active research program, right? So let me ask a question. Is Caroline still around? 
Yes, she's with me. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Uh, I heard your uh, comment, the first part of it. The second part, you said you want the um, phone be sequestered to the collaborators' research. Can you clarify the second part of your comment? Uh, I was just thinking of a way that uh, and it's probably not possible because I don't know all the constraints you have at NIH, but um, it seems to me that uh, having to apply for each one of these supplements, which I mean, it's nice it's going up to $120,000, but it's so labor intensive that if you could instead make a special component of the INBRI five-year award, that would be specifically for INRI collaborations <laughs> with other IDEA programs. It would kind of be like an uh, application for um, alteration renovation, where you just get you know, money for a certain amount of time. Or it could be another kind of a drip, where you, know, you, get, you give a pot of money to the INRI to go after these INRI other okay, idea I got program it. collaborations, I got it. You're, but you're, I know you are asking a separate program. Yes, right? and but I want to. I this want is supplements, so I want to have Christy uh, to help us under, understand the first part of your uh, comment. That I understand that um, the application takes time and. Uh, um, you know, uh, Christy, do you, are you around to? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I did just um, notice um, Dr. Bohach's comment that, you know, there's so much time spent in application preparation. I just wanted to remind everybody that, you know, proposal costs are an f &A cost. They're not really a direct cost. So while, you know, you're putting these together, just make sure that you're budgeting your time um, appropriately and, and that kind of thing. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. I'm um, just going to make that clear for the audience. Thanks. Yeah, I guess I don't keep track of that, Christy. I'm probably doing all kinds of illegal things. I think though that my interaction with these investigators is really part of mentoring, whether, whether we even put in the, the application in the end. Well, of course we would. Well, I'm going to no, get and that's and number. that's understandable. That's true. You know, as as in terms of your um, management of the program, I just wanted to make sure because I'm sure you you know what you're doing, and I just want to make sure that that was clear to everybody that how you budget your time um, and for proposal costs, just to make sure that that's part right. Of and we have or you know, something else, right? In our part. in our INRI office, all of our INRI uh, paid. Uh, administrative appointments, they always have uh, some small percent of their salary not coming directly from the grant so that we always can point to that for anything that they do to, to help grants along. But it's a lot of work for even our Office of Sponsored Programs that aren't paid by the NIH. And at, at both, at all of the institutions, it, it's, it's very l labor intense. So Obviously, we greatly appreciate um, the effort by you and your staff put it into this. You know, um, your mentoring is is absolutely uh, critical for this. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we also encourage you to let the investigators mm. to. The next step of the mentoring is, is to watch them grow, right? So gradually, I think this this it, part of the this collaboration process is also to grow their ability to find collaborators to work with others. Yes, so, I hear you, Ming. I hear yeah. you, and it certainly but, is. Yeah, yes. but I do appreciate as I, as. Uh, your effort, and especially as you mentioned, um, in the state of Idaho, there's no freeway to connect north and south. 
uh, that's just uh, you know part of the the challenge, and also the great actually diversity among the idea state. In Bonzo's case, everybody is within the one point five mile radius, right? <laughs> that's why I did not show the map. <laughs> you, your your challenge is every time you turn around, you're going to elbow somebody. <laughs> but let me, I, I'll put another uh, sort of discussion point uh, out there. Uh, I, I think Bonsu's uh, brief summary of uh, his perspective and observations from the ground, um, what the collaboration really means. Uh, what what they're supposed to do are really uh, on point uh, related to one of the earlier questions, sort of the opposite of it, it. The ones that you didn't pick, what do you do with them? But now that we are three years into this program, the ones actually got funded. Can you guys share? You know, I, I know this. Uh, they're, they're good examples. One of Larry's grantees went on to get get uh, his own project. But overall, do you have something in mind? You know, follow up of those uh, uh, founded collaborative projects. Well, so Ming for us. So you mentioned R one. So we have an R fifteen out of the first one. The second one, which is exposing undergraduate students to clinical research, that one's going to take a while to see outcomes. So, so, so we plan to follow those students and see where they end up going. What's next for them? Do they go on to medical school? Do they go on to graduate school? If they go to medical school, do they get engaged in research? There's a good chance most of them will probably come to our medical school, so we'll be able to, to follow them. I, I think it's important to follow the, how students are impacted by this collaboration. I think that's something we need to work on. And actually, I forgot to add on one of my our um, supplemental award, 2021, Jamie Tower Wixel has just gotten R15, so maybe, Great. yes, yeah. so I'm gonna add well, that. Yeah, so those are the, uh, obviously is some, it's sort of like one plus one is bigger than two, right? Uh, it's hard to draw clearly what where the line is, but uh, hopefully the collaboration sparked something that otherwise wouldn't be there. That's one point. The second point related to what you all just said, and also what I said earlier, in your reporting, we will be very, very interested in how many of your POI students, for example, through the collaboration actually ended up in your medical or graduate program, especially, you know, followed up with uh, the lab that he or she uh, worked with through this opportunity. Yes, I think that's very important. I, I think we'll all follow the students. I, I know in Idaho, it is huge for these students at a primarily undergraduate institution to then access laboratories at the University of Idaho. It's a different world for them. And um, uh, it it breaks down the fear, uh, the, even the thought that they could go on to graduate school. And um, so I do think you you mentioned it, Ming Lei, that this is part of building a pipeline for the students, getting these interactions between programs. Um, it, it's it, I think it will uh, do a lot for the students and we'll follow carefully. Um, I just want to follow up on that. In, in, in Rhode Island, we have, several different the DRPP mechanisms. The two of the most popular significant ones are early career. That's for you know simply supporting junior faculty setting up their lab. And then after that they can actually go for so-called collaborative research mechanism where they have to really choose 
mentor at Brown or University of Rhode Island. And they actually have to perform collaboration together. So we provide funding to a mentor, not much, but some, some amount. The, one of the things that we require for them to do is that the, the mentor at URI and Brown University will have to make a plan for PUI students to come spend time during summer time. So these supplemental grants that we have a three, um, they're actually doing that. So I think this, this is kind of things that we need to uh, promote and this supplemental grants in break over grant is uh, actually supplementing that type of activity, which is wonderful. I, I thought of another thing that's happening with one of these collaborative activities is they're actually having weekly laboratory meetings uh, by distance. So the students at the primarily undergraduate institution are participating weekly in a lab meeting with a group that has graduate students and postdocs, something again that they would never have without this interaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, while we we are always happy to see, let's say, for example, another new grant or, or something like that out of the collaboration. But on the other hand, I think success can be measured uh, many different ways, right? One point that Carolyn might mention during this pandemic, uh, a lot of challenges. For example, one area, the pandemic clearly presented to us how much of a need, how big a challenge the public health, uh, 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 for public health, public health education uh, in that front, right? I think in, you know, um, you, your places are all covered either by a CTSA, which is eligible to, to this mechanism or by a CTR. So, you know, interpret collaboration in a broader sense, not, you know, um, scientists traditionally trying to interpret it just in our own habit of space, right? A perfect collaboration is one person works on a leg and another one works on a receptor. Yeah, that's a great collaboration, but but you know, you have a PUI program, you have a student interested in helping with the, the public health aspect of the uh, of community outreach during the pandemic, someone in, in your CTR program already doing this, for example, doing COVID testing. We supported a number of those. That's a collaboration. We would not turn down that, that kind of collaboration. Right, and also um, the the success is also part of the measure that that we come as well. So, um, just sort of food of thought for for you to leverage this this opportunity. Um, being, I think. We already running late. So before we end the meeting, do you want to, um, Christy, or maybe you want to talk about something about extension of the program? I think there's a lot of questions about that. Extension of the program. So we, it used to be a one year program. We publish a nosy every year. Now that we extend it for three years, that's, that's one sense of extension it also shows our commitment to support the program based on the uh, limited report, but nonetheless, we saw the great promise. And we're going to continue this program uh, for a number of years. The second part of what Yang, uh, Yang alluded to, obviously related to one of the point that, points that uh, Bansu mentioned, is that it is a supplement. Um, is not in perfect sync with the parent grant. It's naturally cross the you know, end of a, a parent grant uh, uh, line 
So naturally, the activities cost two years. So that is another sense of uh, a collabor uh, uh, extension. And you know, you can always ask for uh, extension at the at the end of the the work. So, um, related to this one point I I, I mentioned earlier, the the collaboration. Um, you can look for all kinds of collaborations. And also I want to take this opportunity to come back to Caroline's uh, point about the needs of funding, not to uh, uh, directly, is that as a supplement program, uh, we want to support all kinds of uh, uh, collaborations, but the, the direct fund, direct cost has to be supporting the research activities, right? for our overall uh, effort to promote collaboration, networking, all that, that is part of the mandate of your INBRI program. You know, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we appreciate INBRI PI's effort on that, and you can use your fund from the uh, uh, INBRI award uh, uh, properly. And we have uh, Christy here to provide you all the guidance you need. But, you know, um, as long as everything, uh, you're, you're doing a great job, I think. Um, ask Christy, you have questions. So. Maybe Christy can elaborate on that uh, comment, you know, to if they can't finish the study in the first year, you know, they can always, you know, uh, continue using the parent award funds, you know, and rebudget the fund for the parent grant, you know, because it's within the scope of the program, you know, so overall. You know. So exactly. Like yeah, exactly. Thank you, Christian. That is, um, that's the answer. It's sort of what we've come to the realization over um, the past decade and a half that I've worked with, it, with uh, the IDEA program is that a lot of these projects don't, you know, either supplements or pilot projects don't um, fall exactly within the budget periods of the parent grant. But these administrative supplements are that, they are within the scope of the parent grant. So if your administrative supplement does not have 12 full months of funding remaining when you get your notice of award, you do have the ability to rebudget your parent grant funds to support the continuation of that supplement award into your next budget period. And at the point at which you realize that that may negatively impact your ability to um, complete the aims at which you propose in your type five, because you've moved uh, your money around, you've rebudgeted. At that point, you can request a carryover to say, oh, we spent money to support the supplement. At this point, we've you know, budgeted a shortfall. We'd like to use previous funds for, and then you can explain what you need to use your funds for. Um, that allows the, uh, research to continue of the administrative supplement without any breaks or any interruptions. So it is the leverage you have to rebudget within your grant because the supplement is within the scope of your parent grant. I think that's wonderful. I, I thank you for doing this because we're not worrying about COBRA investigators, investigators who happen to be in you know, research in intensive institution and hospitals, but the PUI faculty, they use their money mostly in, during summer. And so they're really worried about not being able to spend money on time, but this is a great relief. And so I think it's a good thing that you have that flexibility. Great. And, and so, one additional plug would just be to make sure that in the next RPPR, if you are continuing that effort in the next budget period, to make sure that you report on the, um, the supplement, what you did in the next RPPR as well. Right. Christy is saying, do not underreport. right? So, so I want to, uh, as Jan mentioned, we're sort of uh, running out of time, but I want to uh, wrap this up by making a request to you guys, uh, tell your colleagues in your region, I think the three of you are from three of the four regions. The only region we're missing is from Central. I don't know if John's from Central or Jerry, John, uh, I don't know where you guys are from, but tell your colleagues that what they have missed and encourage them 
to contact Jan for whatever material um, from this webinar. I think that, as I mentioned over and over again, I think a lot of people actually, Carolyn said on one hand, it's a lot of work. I think a lot of people on the other hand said, ah, oh, it's a simple supplement. I know how to do it, right? But I think we have shown today there are a lot of useful information out of this. So hopefully they can take advantage of that. Thank you very much.